All right, Ooh, we're so far away. All right, uh, the committee will come to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please take the roll? Chair Hoskins. Here. Representatives Grant. Here. Whitsett. Here. Neely. Here. Liberati. Here. Papias. Here. Farhat. Miller. Here. Tisdale. Here. Ben Workham. Here. Martin. Here. Roth. Here. St. Germain. Here. Mr. Cherry, have a quorum. All right, uh, first order of business. Uh, we will be taking testimony on House Bill 4454 uh, from Representative uh, Tyrone Carter, uh, who is here uh, to testify, uh, along with um, Gina, and I don't want to mess up your last name, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt it, Gina Cavallari? Cavalier. Cavalier, all right, uh, from Downtown Detroit Partnership. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, this morning and please take it away thank you mr. chair and also joining us will be mr. Deshaun Singleton oh. from the DDA thank you mr. chair and members of the committee for allowing me to testify today on house bill you know I'm reading from notes so I won't mess up all right otherwise you know I will freestyle house bill 4454 would amend public act 120 of 1961 which provides for the creation operation and dissolution of business improvement zones to add options for allocating assets among business improvement zones, BIZs, property owners, and to allow for the use of proportional voting to approve, amend, or dissolve a biz plan. Act 120 of 1961, known as the Shopping Areas Redevelopment Act, authorizes principal shopping districts, business improvement districts, and business improvement zones. Business Business improvement zones are special assessment districts initiated, authorized, and governed by the assessed property owners. Property owners collect, prioritize, and fund improvements, maintenance, and operations within the public realm the, that argument city services. Biz zones are subject to Michigan's Open Meetings Act and Uniform Budgeting and Accounting Act, subject to annual audits, and managed by volunteer boards of directors, and the board appoints successors. Currently, there are two existing bid zones operating under Chapter 2 of the Act, Downtown Detroit Business Improvement District and the Southwest Detroit Business Improvement District. In addition, there are plans to, for three bid zones that will be formed should this legislation pass and the stature be returned to its pre-2020 language. They include Ann Arbor Spark, Detroit Corktown Business Association, and a collaboration between Detroit Riverfront Conservancy and Jefferson East. My bill would correct, correct the issues created in 2020 when the state business improvement zone laws was amended to attempt to permit a pr proposed new zone in Grand Rapids to impose assessments on residential properties. That zone was never created and unfortunately changes have been made in the law in 2020 in part to protect residential taxpayers have created barriers to renewal of the new original business zone improvements which have been success successfully serving downtown Detroit for nearly 10 years. The 2020 changes are also preventing the creation of new improvement zones supported by business owners in Ann Arbor and Rivertown districts of Detroit. This bill would undo those changes made in 2020, which have never been used by eliminating language from the statute providing for the assessment of residential and related languages as a requirement that a board member be an owner or residential property. The bill would also restore proportional voting and assessments which have been used in the downtown Detroit Business Improvement Zone since its inception a decade ago. Proportionate voting and assessments assure that the activities of a zone aren't dominated by a single property owner and that the benefits of the assessments and proportion to the amount paid based on both floor area and assessed value of property. Approval of this legislation will permit the downtown Detroit Business Improvement Zone to continue to provide clean services, landscaping, hospitality, security, and holiday lighting for another 10 years. This concludes my testimony, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Gina, and I'm not going to do her last name like you did. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Carter. Um, thank you, Chairperson Hoskins, and to the committee as well. Um, I am Gina Cavalier. I serve as the Executive Director of the Downtown Detroit Business Improvement Zone. I've been in that role since 2015. Um, so I am a technician who has used this tool and in our community has been used very effectively. We 
receive emails from all around the city, the region, and the world about the impact that this program is having in the community. Um, we respectfully ask you to restore the bill to its pre-2020 state. Um, we have convened all of our peers from around the state, and we all agree that this is a, that this is a version that works in all of our communities. Um, Grand Rapids, who was pursuing the residential, decided to use Chapter 1 of the Act instead of Chapter 2. So they, they opted to, to form a business improvement district. So this does not harm Grand Rapids either. Um, we collectively and respectfully ask that you move this forward and that you move it forward quickly so that we can enable the investment of private businesses in the public realm in our, in our downtowns. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Mr. Singleton, I don't know if you had anything to say. Uh, no, just I share that sentiments exactly. Uh, being born in Detroit, I could remember downtown before the biz was enacted. It was like a ghost town, tumbleweeds, every <laughs> block smelled like <laughs> urine. And um, just coming downtown now and how welcoming and inviting is like the sun shine a little brighter on downtown right now. So okay. share those sentiments exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, uh, members of the committee, are there any questions for Representative Carter? Uh, Representative Roth. Hi, guys. Thank you for the testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is there a size requirement? Is there a certain, is there any, I don't see it anywhere in the bill where you have to be a certain size to do this. Would you like me to answer that? Answer that. You're a technician. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no size requirement. That's one of the the beauties of this tool is that it's enabling legislation that lets each community design a district that works for that district. You can use um, different formulas. You know, there are some communities that may say, we want to use this tool to shovel snow on the sidewalks in the business district, and they create a formula that's based on how many feet of sidewalk you have, for example. In downtown Detroit, the most equitable formula is a combination of floor area and state equalized value. So it's it's a tool that's very flexible for communities large and small. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Vice Chair Tisdale. Thank you, Chair Hoskins. Um, real quick, I just want to con confirm on the homestead deferment issue where that language is being removed, there are no residential properties in the two biz zones right now? No, they are, they're not. Um, those biz zones were formed at a time when that was not even an option. And when the, the residential was added in 2020, that was enabling legislation. It did not require the inclusion of residential. Um, looking at a community like Grand Rapids, they have a lot of owner-occupied condos in their downtown. And so there are a lot of downtown property owners that would not have been contributing to a biz, but would be benefiting from the work of the biz. So, that just yeah. doesn't really apply in downtown. No, no existing residential owners are losing anything, and there's no way that a, a business owner is, is qualifying for a homestead exemption. Correct. Good. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Miller. So coming from the local government, how does local government play a role here, like DDAs and planning commissions? Can you talk a little bit about that? Of course. Um, we work very closely with the DDA in Detroit as well as the planning commission. Um, the, as far as the procedure, when a zone is established, it's initiated by the property owners. 30% of the property owners need to petition the city to establish the zone. I see. And then it, it goes through the mayor and city council or whatever the, the legislative process is in that community to endorse a zone plan before the property owners can vote on it. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration with the local government. Um, in, in downtown Detroit, we have a, a system working very closely with the DDA where they focus more on the capital investments and then the business improvement zone focuses on the maintenance of those investments. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Are there uh, any more questions? All right, Representative Carter, thank you so much for your testimony on this. Thank you. All right, um, 
wishing to speak in support of the bill. Phil, I cannot read your last name, so I have, all right, <laughs> from Ann Arbor, <laughs> from Ann Arbor Spark. words in support of this bill. Uh, I just want to give a little bit of additional context. Um, my name is Phil Sanford with Ann Arbor Spark, we're a regional economic development organization, uh, and talk and support around why this is an important change for us as an organization and what we're trying to do some things in our region. So as was stated pr previously, uh, until recently the biz a law allowed zones to be created in a variety of ways. The flexibility that was afforded for this tool made it a very attractive one. Um, that change, the change was made in uh, Hold on, Mr. Sanford, is your mic on? Is that red light on there? There. Is that better? There you go. All right. <laughs> uh, so the change that was created in 2019, 2012 really removed the flexibility that was associated with this law. Uh, and no biz, no bizzes have been created um, since that point in time. Um, why is this important to us? So we've been working with, uh, working for several years with the property owners on the South State, South State Street neighborhood in Ann Arbor to uh, really reinvigorate that place. If you come off of 94 into South State Street, uh, you might be familiar with it, but uh, we wanted to give people a real sense that they're moving into an actual place, a place where there is one of the largest research universities in the country, a place where you have a vibrant downtown and point people in the direction of that, uh, and really just do some aesthetic improvements to that overall area, including signage, uh, better medians, more frequent mowing. Uh, and the changes that we wanted to, to have as part, of that, um, as part of that district overall, we thought a, a biz would be a good tool to use. And we wanted to utilize the tool based on state equalized value of the properties that were in that neighborhood. We thought that was the most equitable way to set up this zone. Uh, when we took the process forward, we went through and gathered everyone up, got everyone really excited and encouraged around this, um, around this effort. Uh, we took it to the city. They did their due diligence, realized that we were not able to set, establish the zone in the way that we had, had wanted. Uh, hence, we started on this process with uh, our colleagues in Detroit and with others in order to try and get this um, established and changed. So it's a very technical change, I realize. It's, it's pretty in the weeds as it relates to some things that are happening at a, uh, at a tactical level, but very important for us to be able to try and uh, reinvigorate a neighborhood that we, we want to put in some additional investment into. So I want to thank our colleagues in Detroit. I want to thank Representative Carter for for um, his leadership on this issue and also for the committee for your consideration on this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Santer? All right, thank you so much. All right, um, looks like there's no one else who wishes to speak. Uh, I'm gonna read in some cards. Okay, let's see. Oh, seeing some of you got a little ahead of the game here and putting in cards of support for bills that are not on the agenda yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, wishing not to speak in support of the bill, we got. Uh, Ryan Schell from the Detroit Regional Chamber, uh, Deshaun Singleton from the Detroit Regional Partnership uh, in support of the bill. Uh, oh, and that is it. <laughs> All right, uh, members, um, unless there is something that comes up, this will probably be coming up for a vote next week. So just to let you all know. Um, next. We will be hearing from um, uh, next. We will be hearing from our friends at Mishta. Um, I'm not sure who we have testifying. Looks like we have Mark Garcia and M oh Amy Hovey. Hey there. Hello. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you for having us here this morning. I am sure that you've heard that housing is an issue because it's an issue across the entire state. It's impacting every, every industry that we have. Um, you know, w we are definitely in a housing crisis that is just getting worse. 
um, when I first um, started talking about housing, we were 150,000 housing units short. Now we're 190,000 housing use, units short. We have new jobs coming to our state with factories that are being built, and we have no place to house the the, the employees of these new businesses. Uh, we have school districts that are now trying to build housing for their teachers because they can't find places for their teachers to live, so they can't attract teachers to their school districts. We have community colleges that are beginning to focus on housing. We have hospitals. We have local governments. It is just hitting every part of our state. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the housing crisis. I'm going to quickly go over some of our existing programs that we have at Mishta. I'm also going to talk a little bit about our statewide housing plan, and then I'm going to end with a really big plea to all of you, and I'll try to be quick. So uh, just a couple stats to reinforce the, the housing crisis. Uh, almost 50% of our renters are paying um, you know, our housing burden paying over 30% of their income for housing. Um, the cost of our housing has gone up 84% for a sale, for sale house. During that same time period, incomes have only gone up 25%, making home ownership out of reach for more and more Michigan families. Um, our workforce has decreased in the construction industry. In fact, uh, the folks from the Home Builders Association said the stat is old, and we actually lost more construction workers than is stated there, so we need to update that. Um, and then our housing stock that we have is, is old. Almost 50% of the homes that we have in Michigan are over 50%, are over 50 years old. So we need to increase um, some subsidy and some incentives in creating new housing and fixing our existing housing um, and helping people into homes. I'll just go ahead and skip that massive list. Um, we do have affordable um, rental housing programs. This is most notably our low-income housing tax credit program that comes from the federal government. This incentivizes mostly multifamily um, rental housing where, um, you know, the, the units are restricted by area median income of the family. Um, they're usually restricted for about a 30-year period, and we incentivize about 5,000 units uh, a year with those programs. We also have a large um, single family mortgage, which does help families into homes. Um, we have just increased um, our down payment assistance program that's associated with our single family mortgage to 10,000. Um, so it used to be 7,500 or 10,000. We've increased it to 10,000 across the state because of the increase of costs of homes. You will also hopefully be seeing a bill come across um, uh, this committee in the future talking about increasing the mortgage amount that we want to be able to um, be able to lend so that we can get more families into homes and we can be reactive to the increase in the cost of housing in our state. We are about 3,000 of those single-family mortgages per year. The Housing um, Choice Voucher Program is uh, an, another federal program um, that really helps the most vulnerable populations in our state. Um, this is a, a, a voucher. You might have heard it called sec Section 8 housing, um, where very low-income families are able to get into housing where the federal government will pay, help assist in paying the rent of, um, for them so that they can be in housing. We um, last year had about 28,000 households. Um, luckily, HUD did increase those um, vouchers by about 10%. They have also increased the amount of um, rental assistance to allow for the increase in the cost of housing. Still not quite there, and you might hear um, some of your constituents complain that they have a housing choice voucher but are having issues finding housing. Um, some of that is because of basic economics, supply and demand. When their housing units are short, 
uh, landlords can ask for a lot of money and can really increase the rents to the point where it really makes the housing choice voucher um, holder have a very difficult time finding housing. We also um, provide some homeless programs at MISHTA. This is also funding that comes through the federal government um, that will help provide funding for shelters um, and homeless prevention programs across the state. We at MISHTA act as the staff, what's called a continuum of care for um, places in our state that do not have their own continuum of care. So most of the major cities and counties have their own. Um, and receive money directly from HUD, but for those in the state that do not, or their populations don't allow for that, MISHTA provides that service to the state. Uh, the Neighborhood Enhancement Program is just that. There really is a small program that helps provide for enhancement grants to stabilize our neighborhoods um, in our older communities across the state. MISHTA MOD program provides for modular housing. Um, this is a fairly new program at, at MISHTA. We are um, working at increasing that. We need to um, be more creative and innovative in how we can get more housing created in a much more expedient manner. The My Half program is a COVID relief program uh, with funding, uh, again, from the federal government that helps provide mortgage payments and um, tax payments for families that were suffering through COVID. Um, this program has helped many families um, across the state. It's slowly running out of money. We probably will um, have to close this program down by the um, end of the year. Um, you may have heard in the last couple of months, we did get approval from the Treasury to allow for this fund to be used to pay people's back taxes going way back. At first, it was only going back to 2019. Um, we asked for an amendment and got approval to be able to go back to uh, with, no, with no time frame. So we are using this program, working closely with the county treasurers um, to make sure that we can help as many Michigan families um, completely get out of arrears with their um, property taxes, helping them to be in a much more stable place going forward. Uh, the Missy Middle Program um, was um, funded through the state, so we thank you for that. We had $50 million last year. You appropriated an additional $50 million at the beginning of this year. This program um, is very flexible in the fact that it provides for both home ownership as well as rental, single family, multifamily, new construction, um, rehabilitation. Um, and it also provides for housing for families between 60 and 120% of, of area median income. Most of our programs are for 80% and below. But because of the housing crisis and the lack of housing that we have in our state, we are finding that families up to 120% and probably actually even beyond that cannot afford housing. So we appreciate the funding for this program. We went out with a second tranche of, of funding of the 80 million earlier this year. In the very first day that we opened that program, we had $220 million worth of applications in the very first day. That just shows you what a demand there is across the state for funding and subsidy for, um, for this type of, of program. Uh, the My Hope program um, provides for energy efficiency. So this helps with the older ho uh, housing stock that we have across the state in providing up to $25,000 per house to increase uh, energy efficiency. This program has been open. We have, uh, I want to say, 1,200 applications um, in for homes across the state. It is statewide. Um, there is a um, common application on our website. Um, we are working with partners across the state to get this program implemented. The Housing and Community Development Fund um, is a fund that's been around for about, I don't know, a couple decades in our state. Unfortunately, it has not been funded. But again, I want to thank 
you all. Last year, you provided um, $50 million for this fund. Earlier this year, you approved a permanent source of financing for this fund. Um, and it allows us to work closely with the stakeholders across the state to um, enact new programs to meet the needs that the federal programs cannot meet. And so you'll see an array of these programs listed up there. I won't go into detail on any of them today, but happy to answer any questions. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the statewide housing plan. Uh, the statewide housing plan was approved last year. It's the first uh, housing plan we've had in our state. We're one of few states across the country that have such a plan. And I have to say, even though this plan was created before I was at Mishta, I'm very thankful that we have it in place. It provides a great guide on how to um, build coalitions, create programs, and work together to address the housing crisis. In front of you, in addition to the PowerPoint, we provided a handout with a map and also a list of agencies. So we're implementing the statewide housing partnership in a couple of ways. One, Governor Whitmer created a statewide housing partnership where she appointed members to oversee the implementation of the plan. And then we also created regional housing partnerships. And you'll see those 15 regions on the map in front of you closely aligned to the prosperity regions with a couple of additions in Southeast Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. In each of these regional housing partnerships, there is an organizational lead. And I wanted to make sure that you had that information in case anyone in your office or any of your constituents want to know how to get involved in housing. We're asking each of these regional housing partnerships to create regional housing plans that are a subset of the statewide housing plan. So they can look at what the needs, the priorities, and the values are of their regions and pick the goals out of the statewide housing plan that most uh, closely align for them. And at MISHTA, it is our hope to use the housing and community development funds and the community development block grant funds to fund those plans. So we're not asking people to create a plan that goes on a shelf. We're asking them to create a plan so that government will know how to best help them achieve their goals. And we expect that in each region, those goals are going to be different. Some are going to be home ownership. Some are going to be capacity building. Some may be rental housing, uh, could be homeless, could be shelters. We want to have the flexibility to be responsive to local governments in regions that we feel know what their needs are best. So with that, I'm going to end with my plea. <laughs> You're going to be seeing um, a, a bill um, come through committee for a new tax increment financing eligible activity. Um, we are in desperate need of that additional tool. Um, and so I will save that testimony for another time. But uh, we also have a bill package of about six other bills that we're hoping will be introduced and come your way in the next couple of months. That package has no appropriations. It just tweaks our existing programs to allow us to better meet the needs of the state. So I ask that when those come through, if you have any questions, our office is always open to all of you to meet individually, to meet with any of your constituents or any of your staff, to be able to explain um, what's in those bills and um, be able to provide the information that you feel like you need to be able to make um, effective decisions. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Director Hovey. And I will add, um, for your benefit and for the members, um, so the TIF bills that Director Hovey is referring to were the bills that actually were taking up uh, last week and uh, the Housing Subcommittee. Uh, those bills were uh, recommended to come back to us, um, uh, recommended that we vote on them. And so next week, we will be taking up those bills here in committee. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to either Chair uh, Chair Coleman, Vice Chair Aragona, uh, the lead sponsor of the bill, which is Senator Singh, or uh, Director Hovey at Mishta, and they'll be able to answer any questions. But we will be voting those out in pretty short order. Um, with that, um, I do have a quick question about the Missing Middle Program. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I had a conversation with uh, Oakland County Executive uh, Dave Coulter, and we were talking about uh, the funding that was allocated for Oakland County. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like there has no one has no one has tapped into it yet in Oakland County, and I was wondering if what can we do to help with that, to help yeah. get that word out that this money is available uh, in Oakland County for developers to use. Yeah, no, that is correct. On that first day when we had all of those funding applications come in, not one for Oakland uh, County, we do have one for Oakland County okay. now. Um, and at Mishta, we have been out and about um, talking about the program um, and really um, and, you know, trying to explain the benefits of the program. Um, and I think that's what you can do as well. I think um, folks are used to us having just those same federal programs, providing the same type of very affordable housing across the state. Um, they're not used to us having this more flexible program to kind of meet the middle income needs. And I think what we need to do is on our end, we have great conversations with developers, but also meeting with governmental officials who kind of lead that um, I think they, they lead the charge in attracting developers to come and do the housing. So I think we can work together on that. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Tisdale. Thank you, Chair Hoskins. Uh, Director, thank you uh, for being here today. <clears throat> Again, relative to that missing middle, the idea of affordable housing is really almost gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 2021, the National Association of, of um, Home Builders uh, released a study indicating that almost $94,000 uh, exists in regulatory costs um, re really before the home is built, about, about $42,000 uh, during development and another $93,000 or $53,000. Uh, during construction. Is there anyone in Michigan looking at these regulatory costs? Are they, are they redundant? Are they overlapping? Uh, what can we do? Is it, do, do zoning codes need to be changed? Uh, 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 development co codes need to be changed? What can be done to remove that upfront $94,000 in regulatory costs? Otherwise, yeah. there's never going to be a $200,000 house. Yeah, yeah, and there there aren't those houses right now, right? Um, you know, we do have our, our friends from the home builders that probably have a lot more information on what those regulatory costs are. I'm not as familiar with those on a single family home that would add up to those other than our typical local permits, fees, hookup charges, and those types of things. Um, but I can tell you that zoning does make a difference. Um, it is much more affordable to have higher density housing than put in all the infrastructure or to have our typical quarter acre homes throughout the state. We will never reach our goal and need um, in just doing those types of homes. So I, I do concur with you on the fact that um, we do need to look at zoning and looking how we can do um, much more dense housing that's better for the environment as well as much more affordable, requires a lot less uh, infrastructure. Thank you. I'll pass along that study and information yeah, to the chair and he can distribute it. And if you could give me someone to follow up with, uh, with the Home Builders Association, that'd be great. I will. All right. Repre uh, you're all set, uh, Representative Tisdale. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Representative Kofia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Thank you for your presentation. So um, my district is the 103rd. It's Traverse City, Leelanau County, and I think um, I certainly won't speak for the rest of the state, but it is a huge, huge crisis in my region. There are sort of assumptions people might make about my beautiful, um, geographically blessed region in terms of income, but I'm thinking about the fact that in Benzie and Grand Traverse County, uh, near over 30% of my residents are Alice, um, United Way's um, you know, qualification of right at, uh, they're working poor essentially, at or below the poverty level. And then Leelanau County, 43% um, of my constituents are Alice households. So when we look at things like uh, in your presentation, it was staggering, you mentioned the cost of a house went up 84% between 2013 and 2020. 
I am thinking about the impact on, on my residents, those families' ability to, to thrive in my region. So what are some of the root causes? I have my guesses, what I've uh, heard and seen, but what, from your and Mishta's perspective, are some of the root causes for that increase, and do you have specific plans to address those challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a, a couple of things that have resulted in the increase of our costing. One is, I mentioned the decrease in labor. Um, we had supply chain issues during COVID. So when it's hard, when you have a decrease in labor and supplies, the cost of those things individually go up. Um, I, we also have had such an increase because of the decrease in availability, right? So the the amount of houses, even though our state isn't growing that well, uh, you know, our household size is shrinking. It's about 50% of what it used to be. And so you can imagine, even if your population stayed stagnant, if your housing size decreases, you need twice as much housing. And so uh, a lot is simple economics with supply uh, and and uh, demand. So when the supply is down and the demand is high, um, the cost of, of the housing goes up. We also have had um, some issues across the state and specifically in your district as well with short-term rentals. So a lot of the increase in short-term rentals have decreased our supply yet again of rentals for folks that are living there year-round. And so between those different um, uh, uh, stats, it's really just increased the cost of our, our housing to the point where we cannot build a house for less than 300000 You all say it right Oh, you wanted our plan. Just, yes, I would love the follow-up piece, too. So, Amy, how are we going to fix it? Yeah. So, I think, you know, we're working together with lots of different stakeholders across the state to look at a couple of things. One, how can we use our existing programs more efficiently? Um, we um, need to decrease the time it takes us to get money out the door so that we're not suffering from the increase of costs happening um, as, as much as we had during COVID. We also need to leverage additional funding beyond just government funding. So we're working really hard with um, the business, communica or business community across the state to try to get additional people involved in creating housing and investing in housing. I think you'll also see there there's some creative things that have been actually up in Traverse City again at looking at how can we help with um, uh, community capital being invested in housing. So think about your crowdfunding of sorts, but how can we get much better at that to get more money into housing? Um, in addition, you're going to see the tax increment financing tool come across your table. Um, and then there's some other tools that we are talking about as well that um, hopefully you will see um, that will help partner and leverage additional funding from the federal government, from, from philanthropy and others to be able to create really more innovative and flexible um, and easy to use government programs. We, we need the funding, but we also need to get the funding out the door and to get rid of as many regulations as we possibly can to make it easy to use the funds at the same time making sure we're getting quality housing um, built. All right, uh, Representative Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, you had 25000 for energy savings uh, mm -hmm. programs. What's the average uh, annual savings you get out of that? The um, uh, we, I don't know at this point because every single one of those energy efficiency houses are different, though we are required to track what that savings are, and so we should be able to um, next year be able to have some of those numbers to be able to report back yeah, be nice on what, what those are. Is, yeah. mm -hmm. All right, thank it. Any more questions from oh, Representative Roth? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to have the question. Um, you answered some of it, Amy, with the why we now have a 190,000 home missing area. Um, as I represent the 104, which is right around the 103, um, partly short term rental, but we also have 
to our success multiple second homes. Yeah. So we have both issues going on. Um, but why, why the missing, why are we adding more? Why do we need more? Are we losing homes? Uh, what's the answer that we need now 190 over 150 before yeah well I mean some of it is our some of our housing stock is old so we've had some pretty aggressive demolition programs across the state um, but you know as I mentioned our housing size has shrunk so we're you know we used to have like four plus you know people per household now we're at two plus people per household so that just in itself increases the demand for additional housing units um and you know we are attracting more um uh, workers to Michigan and trying to increase the economic development that we're having across the state which is also beginning to put some additional demand across housing and if I may chair yeah. um how do you work with Habitat for Humanity uh, is that one of your partners or no yeah, we, uh, Misha has had a long-term relationship with Habitat for Humanity. Um, right now we are working with them um, on their programs in a couple of ways. Um, a lot of the different affiliates apply for our program. So you will see within Missing Middle, there's several different Habitat for Humanities across the state that participate in that. Um, some of our other um, single-family home um, programs like Mishta. Mish and Mishta Mod are highly utilized by Habitat for Humanity. Um, and we also have a relationship with the state uh, Habitat for Humanity where we provide funding for them to provide to their affiliates for down payment assistance. Have you thought about a revolving fund for them? I know our Northern, Northwest Michigan Habitat for Humanity have asked for like a revolving fund where they'll pay it back, but they will just need that startup. Well, you should point them our way. I will do that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Van Workum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Director, for coming before the committee today. Um, housing certainly isn't a, a new topic, as you testified to. This is something that's been going ongoing probably since Mishta was, was created. This has been a topic, but it seems like uh, there's been more and more emphasis lately, maybe the past five years or so. And we've got MISHTA, um, and as you said, there's federal partners, there's state partners, they're philanthropic. I knew I should not have gone with that word. <laughs> charitable, charitable. <laughs> there's, um, there's city uh, dollars that go in this. There's a lot of creative things um, near my hometown in, in Muskegon that uh, they're doing things as it relates to housing. Uh, just last week, um, the House passed a budget that, if you look through it, you could find how at least 400 million new dollars could be used for housing projects in the state of Michigan because of how it was worded and, and things like that. I'm just curious, you know, maybe it's taking a, a look at maybe the last five years, how much money has been allocated from a federal, for maybe just the taxpayer dollars, maybe we even put away the the charitable dollars and you know the private dollars. How many how many taxpayer dollars has the state looked at this? Have we done to address housing as as an issue? Yeah, um, I, I don't have that number for you, but I can certainly follow up if you want it on an annual basis or. Um, if you have a certain time period you're looking at. I will tell you that, you know, with starting last year was the really the first time that Mitch has got state appropriated funding. Other states have, in addition to their federal funding, um, provided funding for housing, uh, you know, for, for, for decades. In Michigan, uh, we had relied fully on the federal government until last year when uh, we got our first appropriation from the state and um, some this year as well. So we're thankful for the added funding to address our housing crisis in the state. But I'm happy to get you whatever data you want on that. Um, and I also let you know that we're um, in the, the beginnings of working to create an evaluation um, 
program at MISHDA so that we can evaluate the impactfulness of our of the funding that we put in the state. Of course, right now we can tell you how much we've put in and how many housing units have been created, but we do not have the data yet to really talk about the full impact of that housing on the state, but we are working on getting that information. May I follow up? Yeah, I guess I'd be curious of how you do that evaluation. Um, certainly it sounds good when you say you're helping this many families, but I think the goal should be maybe fewer families, right? If we're being successful in this program, it's boosting people up and out of needing those programs and assistance and poverty. So some of those qualification measures, it's good to know who we kind of supported as a trampoline that they hit and then we were able to push up rather than saying we are now helping more and more people. I don't see yeah. that as a, a good statistic. We want to be actually the goal of these programs help less that we're propelling people out of poverty. Yeah, I, I concur. Exactly what we want to, to, to do the full evaluation and we have to hire consultants again to figure out how to get that done. Because um, you're right, like I said, we forever could tell you how many housing units we've created and how much money we've put in, but what we really need to do is tell you that kind of full impact, like how many families have um, moved to home ownership and has that home ownership actually helped them create you know, generational wealth, which is what we think we know, but it would be great to actually have that data to prove that that's happening. So I 100% agree with you, and that's why we're moving in that direction to get that information. All right, thank you. Uh, any more questions from members? All right, Director Javi, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, next up, um, We'll be taking up uh, Senate Bill 35. We'll be uh, doing a vote on it. Uh, we heard testimony on this last week. Uh, first, we have an amendment uh, offered by Representative Van Workum. Uh, and Representative, did you want to speak to your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, committee members, before you have an amendment um, to the bill, um, what we're trying to do here, um, as we heard testimony about the SNAP benefits, uh, under this amendment, uh, currently um, uh, those receiving food assistance um, can purchase pop, soft drinks, soda pop, soda, cola, wherever you're from, however you say it. Um, but uh, on part of that is uh, the deposit that comes with it. And we have heard instances where uh, they're buying pop, sometimes they just, those that are using it, sometimes they just pour it out. Um, obviously, they are consuming it, but then they get that cash back from that deposit and then are using it to purchase things that you are not allowed to on food assistance, such as alcohol and tobacco and things like that. So this amendment would still allow for the purchase of pop, but if you're doing that, you would have to pay the actual deposit as cash uh, rather than having that go through uh, through your um, SNAP benefits. With that, I move my amendment. All right. Representative, Representative Miller, do you have a, you had a question? Yes. Okay. Um, to the representative's comments, who, ha who here hasn't poured out a soda that they didn't finish? Listen, people that need these benefits ne aren't always able to even afford the deposit. But to take that portion out, I think it's a stigma that, that we're putting on these folks. I was one of them. I was raised on food stamps I, and welfare. I was the poor. So to have that deposit come out of our own pockets, it would have been absolutely horrific to our budget. We were living from nothing, and this got us through. So if they're buying sodas or um, energy drinks or what have you, I don't think they should have to pay a deposit based on what they pour out. I, I don't agree with that. Okay. Um, I don't believe there was a question there. Yeah. 
Well, um, with that, um, let me, we're going to take up the uh, amendment for a vote. The question before us is adopting the amendment to uh, SB 35. Uh, Madam. Uh, Representative uh, Van Werken moves to adopt the amendment. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? On the motion to adopt, Chair Hoskins? No. Representatives Grant? No. Wissett? No. Neely? No. Liberati? No. Tafia? No. Farhat? No. Miller? No. Tisdale? Yes. Van Workham? Yes. Martin? Yes. Roth? Yes. St. Germain? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have five yeas, eight nays, zero pass. The amended is not adopted. All right, uh, hearing no further amendments, uh, Representative Grant moves to report SB 35 uh, with recommendation. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? On the motion to report, Chair Hoskins? Yes. Representatives Grant? Yes. Wissett? Yes. Neely? Yes. Liberati? Yes. Coffia? Yes. Farhat? Yes. Miller? Yes. Tisdale? Pass. Van Workham? Pass. Martin? Pass. Roth? Pass. St. Germain? Pass. Mr. Chair, you have eight yeas, no nays, five pass. Uh, Senate Bill 35 supported with recommendation. All right. Uh, Representative Neely moves to approve the minutes from the May 9th meeting. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, there being no further business before the committee, the committee will stand adjourned.